The tools of war can often determine the outcome of that war, but unlike any other tool for any other job, a weapon is a tool designed for one purpose, to be deadly, to kill. Here we look at three of the many deadly weapons fielded by both sides during the Second World War. In terms of weaponry, the submachine gun sits somewhere between the pistol and the fully automatic combat rifle. In effect, it is used like a scaled down assault rifle known as a carbine, but fires pistol sized ammunition most commonly but not exclusively of the 9mm variety. The submachine gun was invented during the First World War, its origins beginning somewhat logically with the development of automatic pistols and then growing to include small rifle sized weapons with similar internal workings to these earlier automatic pistols, including remaining chambered for the pistol round. The submachine gun offered numerous advantages in close quarter fighting, such as that encountered when assaulting or defending a narrow trench. For one thing, compared to the larger and heavier rifles typically carried by troops in the trenches such as the British Lee Enfield 303 or the German Gewehr 98, the submachine gun was both easier to swing around onto an enemy and could unleash many more rounds a minute than the bolt action weapons. A soldier armed with a submachine gun could easily mow down a group of enemy soldiers bunched up together as they would be in a trench. The main drawback of a submachine gun, however, was that it lacked the effective range of a full sized combat rifle. It was for this reason that the Germans primarily used them for infiltration units, small teams that would sneak behind the enemy front line to conduct reconnaissance or disrupt supply lines. The usefulness of the submachine gun was not lost after the war, and not just with militaries but also amongst many law enforcement agencies in the US who found themselves facing organized crime gangs who were themselves heavily armed thanks to the war's surplus. In 1921, probably the most famous submachine gun in the world was pronounced namely the Thompson, which of course is better remembered as the Tommy gun and became a symbol of the war between the police and the gangsters of the 1920s and 30s. The Thompson would itself be adapted to a military weapon and would see extensive service in the Second World War with the Allies. The British developed the Sten Gun, a weapon which could be broken down into small pieces, making it easier to conceal, and was thus airdropped in large numbers to resistance groups in Europe and Allied agents operating behind the lines. The Germans meanwhile developed the lethal MP40, a weapon which is probably as iconic as the Thompson, but it was on the Eastern Front where we find the most deadly of submachine guns, the PPSH-41. The story of this incredible weapon begins with the Soviet invasion of Finland in 1940, sparking the so-called Winter War. Submachine guns were widely used by both sides, as much of the fighting took place in dense forestry forcing both sides into close quarter combat. The Soviet forces were dissatisfied with the performance of their own weapons, particularly in the face of the Finnish Sumi KP-31 submachine gun, which had a 71 round drum magazine. The Soviets therefore decided to instigate development of a new submachine gun which adopted a copy of the 71 round magazine of the Finnish weapon, which resulted in the PPD-40, which was rushed into production. Unfortunately, the PPD-40 was too expensive to be produced in the numbers required for the vast Soviet Red Army, so a cheaper version was quickly developed using components that could be manufactured in metal factories and workshops by relatively unskilled workers if production needed to be expanded quickly. The resulting PPSH-41 was therefore easy to mass produce with around 3,000 being made every day in the spring of 1942. With the Red Army desperate for any kind of weapon to give their huge numbers of troops to face the German onslaught, it was not uncommon for entire units to field nothing but the PPSH-41. A common tactic was for troops armed with a submachine gun to follow behind Soviet tanks as they blasted through the German lines, allowing the Soviets to pour in and engage the Germans at close quarters, where the submachine gun was brutally effective. Compared to the German MP-40 submachine gun, the PPSH-41 had a longer range, fired a more powerful round, 
had a higher muzzle velocity than the Finnish inspired 71 round magazine and had almost double the rate of fire. Another interesting feature was that it had a simple gas compensator designed to prevent the muzzle from rising when firing bursts which increased accuracy. Eventually the Germans themselves would officially adopt the weapon by modifying captured versions to fire German rounds and even produce training manuals on how to operate it, as well as infantry, tank crews, and even air crews would carry the weapon in case they found themselves having to abandon their vehicles or aircraft behind enemy lines. Some were also experimentally mounted on aircrafts for use as an offensive weapon, although this was not a success. Unfortunately, the PPSH-41 was by no means a perfect weapon, and it had a number of drawbacks. For one thing, the fact so many factories were involved in its production resulted in minor imperfections creeping into them, which often meant that parts were not interchangeable with those produced in other factories. The aforementioned gas compensator also had a serious drawback, and that it increased muzzle flash which would reveal an otherwise concealed Soviet soldier's position. The 71 round drum was also prone to misfeeding, jamming the weapon which was deadly in close combat fighting leading to engineers designing a more reliable curved magazine with a more modest 35 rounds. Finally, it also featured a very simple sliding bolt safety that had a nasty habit of accidentally discharging a round if the weapon was knocked about. Despite these drawbacks, the weapon proved one of the keys to Soviet success in many battles. The weapon remained in widespread use after the war, being produced in several countries such as China and Czechoslovakia. In fact, weapons were being produced in Croatia to use during the Yugoslavian wars in the 1990s that, while didn't look like the PPSH-41, had identical inner workings. The arrival of the tank onto the battlefield revolutionized the way wars were fought. Tanks could not only traverse almost all obstacles in their path that would have stopped soldiers or horses in their tracks, but they possessed heavy firepower and perhaps most importantly were protected by armor. The threat posed by the tank led all sides to invest in the development of anti-tank weapons that could be used by infantry who were the most vulnerable to these new weapons if no friendly tanks or artillery were nearby. The early tanks were well protected against most rifle-based ammunition fielded by the troops, so one of the first steps taken was to design more powerful rifles intended to punch through the armor and kill the crew inside. Being the first to face an armored assault, the Germans took the lead in developing anti-armor bullets and heavy rifles such as the K-Round, which could be fired from a regular rifle and then later dedicated anti-tank rifle, the 13.2mm Mauser 1918 T Gewehr. By the outbreak of World War II, the armor on main battle tanks had become so thick that such rifle-based weapons became ineffective. The only answer was to adopt weapons that fired explosive rounds at the target tank, and this led to the famous US Bazooka, which launched a rocket with a small explosive charge at the target. The Germans were so impressed with the Bazooka that they developed their own, larger version and dubbed it the Panzerschreck, while at the same time beginning work on another, potentially more powerful anti-tank weapon that would give the infantrymen a potent tool with which to destroy tanks. In 1942, the Germans began work on developing and testing the Faust Patrona, which fired a small 400 gram explosive at the target. In tests, the Faust Patrona could penetrate up to 140 millimeters of basic steel armor, and the German army was so impressed that as well as ordering it into production, they requested development of an even larger weapon designed along similar lines, resulting in the Panzerfaust. The initial Panzerfaust, the Panzerfaust 30, weighed 5.1 kilograms and was slightly over a meter in length. It consisted of a basic launch tube at the front of which was the oversized projectile, which slotted into the tube via its wooden tail stem that featured folding metal fins to stabilize it in flight to the target. At first glance, the Panzerfaust appeared to be a rocket weapon, but this is not the case. It is in fact a recoilless rifle, since unlike a rocket which has a motor in the projectile, the Panzerfaust only uses a single propellant charge to hurl it from the launcher to the target. After firing, the tube could be thrown away by the soldier wielding it who could quickly resort to his rifle, making him an ordinary infantry man again, something that wasn't the case with the Bazooka and Panzerschreck teams. The Panzerfaust gave the basic German infantryman a formidable anti-armor punch thanks to the design of its warhead which featured a shaped charge design. By shaping the explosive charge rather than just bundling as much explosive as possible into the warhead, 
It focuses the destructive power into a single point, thus creating its ability to penetrate the armored hull of a tank. Unfortunately, there were some serious drawbacks, particularly in the earlier models. Firstly, the initial Panzerfaust had an effective range of just 30 meters, a terrifying prospect for a German soldier hoping to destroy a tank, which in case of the American M4 Sherman often bristled with three machine guns, one in the hull, one in the turret, and one on top of the turret. Secondly, if another German was unlucky enough to find himself behind the soldier firing the Panzerfaust, then the exhaust gases were potentially lethal up to 3 meters away. Efforts to improve the range and effectiveness of the weapon led to the Panzerfaust 60, which as the name implies, had a range of 60 meters, double the initial model, but this was still unnervingly close. The Panzerfaust 60 would become the most recognizable variant of the series, and with a combination of its higher velocity projectile and shaped charge explosive, could punch a hole through some 200 millimeters of steel armor. In comparison tests, the Panzerfaust 60 was able to make a hole nearly six times the size of that produced by a bazooka when fired at the same density of armor. Additionally, while range was an issue of the open plains of the Eastern Front, when the fighting would switch to the streets of Polish and eventually German cities, the Panzerfaust became an ideal ambush weapon as tanks trundled down the narrow streets with German soldiers hiding in the destroyed buildings. The Panzerfaust was also useful against lightly armored vehicles like the US Half-Track or against dug-in enemy positions. Later models saw range extended yet again, this time to 100 meters and eventually 150 meters. But alas, these versions saw limited use as by then the German war machine was all but finished. Nevertheless, the Allies took note of the effectiveness of the Panzerfaust, with several American units capturing large stocks of them and turning them on their former owners. Ex-German Panzerfaust and locally produced copies would remain in service with various armies up until the 1950s. While a powerful weapon, the Panzerfaust only accounted for a small percentage of the total number of Allied tanks destroyed in combat. This was because the Germans, quite rightly, preferred using tanks, anti-tank guns, artillery, and aircrafts to destroy Allied tanks. However, it destroyed more tanks than all other German infantry-based anti-tank weapons combined. Despite this, however, the sight of German troops popping out of destroyed buildings or from concealed positions in the forest carrying this unique looking and deadly weapon must have been terrifying for Allied tank crews who would probably be left wondering where the next one will be fired from. Few weapons can claim to have had such a profound influence on the Allied war effort as the M1919 Browning machine gun. Its origins can be traced back to the M1917 Browning machine gun designed by John Moses Browning, who filed the initial patent for the weapon back in 1900. The M1917 was a crew-served, belt-fed machine gun that was cooled as it fired by a water jacket around the barrel, and it became the standard US heavy machine gun during the closing stages of the First World War. While capable of around 450 rounds a minute, the weapon was, as the name suggests, a relatively heavy and cumbersome weapon, and so efforts were made to make a lighter, air-cooled version resulting in the M1919. Despite being considerably lighter than the M1917, the M1919 was still something of a beast to manhandle requiring at least two men to operate effectively in an infantry role. However, its high rate of fire, stopping power, and reliability made it an excellent weapon for not only defending a dug-in position, but also being mounted on the growing number of motorized vehicles replacing horses in the U.S. Army, including tanks. Throughout the two decades of the interwar years, the weapon would undergo significant development to improve its performance and make it easier to use. Consequently, it was built in a number of variants for a number of roles while still chambered for the .30 rifle bullet, something which eased the burden on the logistics chain. By 1939, as well as lightweight variants being carried by the infantry, there were various models mounted on jeeps, trucks, armored personnel carriers, amphibious vehicles, tanks, patrol boats, and ships. However, it was in the air that the weapon was about to make probably its biggest contribution to the fight against the Nazi regime. Both the US Army and Navy fitted variants of the weapons to their own aircraft. At the time, the Army commanded all land-based U.S. air operations since the U.S. Air Force would not be founded until 1947. Then, in the mid-1930s, Britain was rearming its own air force and was developing two new advanced monoplane fighters, the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire, 
Both of these aircrafts were designed to carry eight machine guns, and the weapon chosen was a variant of the M1919, but chambered to fire the British 303 round. During the Battle of Britain, it was the combination of these two aircrafts coupled with the Browning machine gun that would keep the German Luftwaffe at bay, and in doing so, deny Hitler his victory. Unfortunately, the increasing level of armor on German planes meant that the 303 round was becoming increasingly obsolete as it lacked the penetrative power necessary to remain viable. A stopgap solution was some Hawker Hurricanes fitted with a mind-boggling 12 of these guns to increase the collective damage on the target, but they were soon replaced with more powerful weapons. The British initially reduced the number of Brownings to four, while two Hispano 20mm cannons were used in place of the deleted weapons, which had considerably more punch, while the Americans adopted the 50 caliber M2 Browning machine gun in their fighters such as the North American P-51 Mustang. British and Canadian bombers would retain the 303 Browning in their night bombers, such as the Avro Lancaster and the Hanley Page Halifax, until the end of the war, however. In the Far East, the gun remained a viable air weapon for longer, as the Japanese traded armor protection for greater speed and agility in their aircrafts, but it was now back on the ground that the M1919 would make its biggest impact on the enemy. It gave the Allies a potent capability against massed formations of enemy infantry. The definitive infantry version was the M1919A6, which was put into service to make up for the disappointing performance of the M1918 Browning automatic rifle. It was again made as light and ergonomical as possible, with greater emphasis being placed on the ease of use and maintenance. However, compared to the equivalent German machine guns such as the MG42, which was almost a third lighter, it was still a cumbersome weapon. Despite this, it not only remained in service until the end of the war, but beyond as well. Variants of this incredible weapon would go on to serve in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, as well as extensively with the Israeli forces in the numerous wars with their Arab neighbors up until the 1980s. Many European armies would also adopt the weapon post-war, and have them rechambered for the standard 7.62mm NATO round, until finally, the weapon began to be replaced by newer weapons, such as the M60 in the 1980s.